يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا Dear brothers and sisters, we begin with praise. We among the people of the earth should be in a deeper state of praise. We are living in a paradise. We are watching hurricanes destroy complete cities. We are watching millions of people with nothing displaced. We're watching people in Myanmar, their whole lives being destroyed, burned alive. And we are living in like paradise. It is incumbent upon every single one of us to really reflect upon the favors and the blessings that the Almighty Provider and Sustainer is giving us. We are soaking them up every single day. That requires us to be more in a state of servitude, more in a state of divine remembrance, so that we can be beacons of light to help bring people out of the darknesses and hardships that they find themselves in. So we ask in the most humble way that He guide us. We ask divine guidance. We seek the knowledge of His book. We seek a connection in the example of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we ask His forgiveness. Because we're all going to come up short. We will all sin. And so when we sin, we ask His forgiveness. And then we go out and we struggle and strive to uh, exert ourselves further in His service. I bear witness that there is no deity and nothing worthy of worship except for God alone. And I bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, was his final messenger and prophet sent to mankind so that they could realize and actualize ultimate divine mercy. This is the reality we see. Now, it was like three, four weeks ago when this Charlottesville event happened. I was watching that and I had some deep rooted feelings and I felt we have to make a sermon but that week and the week after we had certain things going on with Eid in our community and the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah I had to postpone it. So I did not postpone this sermon today and now this is some sort of thing we're talking about that passed. Whoever thinks that what happened in Charlottesville has passed is living in a hole somewhere. What happened in Charlottesville is the manifestation of white supremacy. Something that we've been seeing for a large part of recent world history in a very, very disastrous, harmful way. You see, the people of Charlottesville came together and said, we should not have statues celebrating and commemorating people who were part of the Confederate Army. Because those people fought to maintain oppression as an economic surplus in slavery. Those people were fighting to keep people who had been ripped from their homelands, stripped of their identities, and made into subhuman animals by their actions. They wanted to maintain that. And so these people from all over the country actually, from different white supremacist movements from the KKK, the alt-right, the Nazis, they all got together and they formulated a response. So they got these tiki torches and they went in hundreds of them, some said thousands, and they all went there to go appreciate and commemorate and to threaten anyone who would take away what they say is the heritage of their country in the confederate statue that is celebrating people who fought and murdered to maintain slavery when this country was trying to move past that by following some of the lofty ideals in this country. So it's important for us to know our history. You see, if you don't know your history, how are you going to learn so that bad things don't repeat themselves? 
the late great Marcus Garvey, he said, a people without knowledge of their history, their origin and their culture are like a people that are like a tree without roots. Most of us here, I'm looking at you, are either Americans or parents of Americans. And this is very important to look at because it is essential that we understand American history if we're going to live in America. Because we are now becoming part of and writing American history by virtue of the reality of us living here. We must specifically know the American Muslim history and appreciate that. This is so that we may build and develop a successful, good Muslim American future. This is what we're doing here. The Islamic understanding of humanity is as the verse that we read in the introduction to the sermon. All people, all mankind, you should be mindful of your Lord who created you all from a male and a female. You are all a human family. And so the Prophet ﷺ emphasized this because the people to whom he was sent were very tribal. Even though they looked the same and spoke a similar language, they had some very strong tribal differences that were very harsh and were very definitive. So the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَوْحَى إِلَيَّ أَن تَوَاضَعُوا حَتَّى لَا يَفْخُرَ أَحَدٌ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٌ That indeed God has revealed to me this message. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves with each other so that no one will ever have false pride over someone else. The Prophet ﷺ so eloquently said, الْأَرْوَاحُ جنود مجندة فما تعارف منها تلف وما تناكر منها اختلف He said the souls are coming from one source and they will gather and come together in certain ways and so whichever of these souls come into life and they get to know each other and they build a connection they will have an affectionate bond where they will take care of each other and then he said and those souls they turn their backs on each other, you will see them in conflict. You will see them in difference because they're ignorant of each other. And so it's an interesting point when you study the concept of urf. The Arabic language, the Quran says, wa'mur bil urf. Allah said, wa'mur bil urf. Because it's the root of ma'roof. Al urf is the culture and the customs of a people. Ta'aruf. When the Qur'an said, لِتَعَرَفُوا He created you different, so that for the purpose of you getting to know each other, so that you can learn from each other. Ta'aruf is to say, look, here's my background. Here's my human experience. Here's what I've learned. And then this one can say, here's what I've learned. And that adds to the value of that. And then the human reality grows in its connectivity of appreciating its diversity. This is what the hadith is telling us. And so, Ma'roof, according to Imam al-Asfahani, one of the great scholars, he said, Mastahsanuhu shar'an wa aqlan wa urfan. Ma'roof, what many of you have seen translated as good, literally means that which is known. Meaning, that which has come to be known as good and acceptable and something that we should all appreciate. So the scholar said, it's first and foremost found in the scripture, in the revelation, we will definitively know from divine truth what is good through the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet But the scholars added to that, that when people as a collective, Muslim or non-Muslim, when they deem something as good and that is not conflicting with the Qur'an or the sunnah, meaning the Qur'an and the sunnah have not said that's bad, then it becomes something in our religion sacred. It becomes ma'roof. We should appreciate it. And that is why as Muslims, when we move anywhere, we should not be separatists. We should not be exclusivists. We should be integrated people who are known and appreciated for what we have. And we learn from our neighbors what they have learned. We feel their pain. We appreciate their values. And if we differ, we differ with respect. This is the Islamic teaching 
of dealing with people. You see, brothers and sisters, the Muslim community living in America is way behind in learning to appreciate the importance and the priority of establishing an American Muslim identity. See, this is what will make us strong. This is what will give us a firm cultural historical root in this society so that we and our children and their children and their children's children can thrive. This is a Quranic directive, brothers and sisters. It is no secret why Allah said about the Prophet, Rasulam minhum. What do you mean minhum? The Prophet ﷺ is a messenger from among his people. To add their brother. Oh my people. Worship God alone. You have no other God beside Him. So what the prophets were told and what they were, they were from their people and that was very important for the success of their mission. Can you imagine? If the Prophet ﷺ was a Jew and he was sent to go among the Arabs and be their prophet and their leader, how would that have been received? That is not divine wisdom. So would it make sense when it says you in the Qur'an after the death of the Prophet ﷺ and even in his life, what was that referring to? Anyone reading this book and believing in it. <clears throat> you go tell them. Qul. He is God and there is only one and none other. So this is the directive. So what is it telling us to do? It's saying you must become part of this country America so that people will know you, you know them, you can appreciate them, they can appreciate you, you can feel their pain and then they will feel your pain. But when you stay exclusivist or separatist, where it's us, we have our little place, alhamdulillah this place said here, you can come, educational opportunities, you can get wealth, you can build your mosques and practice and preach your religion. So we're just going to stay house, mosque, halal restaurant, home. We're going to stay in there. Why? Lest we be misguided by these non-Muslims. Do you believe? in that statement or are you shaky in your faith in that statement? Rather what we saw from the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophets before, they were in society, people knew them, they knew where they came from, he understood them. Can you imagine how it would have been if the Prophet entered someone's house and did not know the customs of how they interacted? How would it be that he could get to their heart and let them see the beauty of what he has to offer? It would be very strange. And that is where we have to see where we stand. So Rasulam minhum, we are messengers from among the people where we live. Our identity, obviously, Shaitan is going to whisper to you or somebody is going to hear this and go off and Shaitan is going to fool them. This guy is going to try to tell you to lose your culture. He's telling you to become Americanized. No, this guy is telling you exactly what the Quran and Sunnah has told you to do. And that is first and foremost, you root yourself in the revelation that came from the miraculous prophethood. And while you're doing that, you root yourself with the society you live in and you form bonds and relationships with the people you live with. And you do not fear because you have your foundation in your faith. And you see the value of the place that you came to because it's telling you, you're welcome to come here and practice and preach your religion as you like. But at the same time, we have to be relevant. We have to know who we're talking to and how to relate with them. This only can start because it's a huge multifaceted reality. All the world's problems, the Muslim Ummah and what it's facing from so many angles. Americans and what we're facing as American people, Muslims and what we're dealing with. It has to start with getting to know the experience of the African American Muslim community. These people are the elders, those are the sabiqun. 
Those are the Ansar that are welcoming you here. You have to come live with them. As the Prophet ﷺ took the Muhajireen from Mecca and made them live with them. To learn from them. Because they have an experience that we don't understand. They've been going through for 400 years what we've been whining and complaining about for a few decades. They have an experience to learn from. This is what we're talking about. I one brother whenever I made this point to him, he said, I went to one of their mosques and it seems like they don't understand Islam very well. Number one, the Prophet said, Oha ilayya anta wadau hatta la yafkura ahadun ala ahad. Humble yourselves. Don't thrust yourself in people's reality with pride and separate yourself because you think you're better than them. Allah is the judge of the hearts and that is where His judgment will go. So you know what I found out? Because I have very many friends. I'm proud to say, and elders and people I look up to and have learned from, from the black Muslim community of America. And you know what they say? Because they have great grandparents been Muslim since the 1950s and 60s and 40s and 30s before it. They've been here. They are the original Muslims of this country. And you know what they say? When these immigrants started to come, they didn't want to come to our mosque. And they didn't, when we went there, they didn't embrace us. We felt like we were treated differently. This very khutbah, if my skin was black, would be taken differently. We have a sickness and disease in our own community that is in complete conflict with so many scriptures and the core of this religion in our community. So you say, how come they didn't become scholars and grow and all of that? Well, because they were welcomed into the mainstream. When they said, we're from the mainstream. And they've been saying that since the 50s. Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz made that move in the 60s. But others before him started to see what he saw. He was just one of the greatest leaders in the history of the Muslim Ummah. Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz. One of the greatest leaders in the history of of the Islamic world. By his humble reassessment and self-accountability, he brought in hundreds of thousands of people into the religion of Islam. And then after him, the one that inspired him, but he wasn't strong yet with the audacity to say to his father, that I know that you are not a prophet. What of Deen Muhammad? May God have mercy on his soul as well. He came and he brought so many people into Islam. And then we have the great Muhammad Ali. If you don't know who Muhammad Ali is, I don't know where you've been. But if you look at the videos of Muhammad Ali, you look at the stands he took against the United States government, ready and willing to strip himself of everything. And he did for many years. Because Islam says, we do not join an unjust war in Vietnam. He did it all over the news. And then people would talk to him on the media and he would start translating ayahs from the Quran in interviews in political context because he was proud for who he was. These are great leaders in world history that we have to learn from their experience. It is crucial for our kids to come to know who is Imam Siraj Wahaj? If you look at his history, it is something that will be written as very large in the history of the Muslim Ummah. People like scholars like Imam Zaid Shakir, Abdullah Hakim Quick, Sherman Jackson. These are great leaders living in our presence today with amazing work in the intellectual sphere, in leading communities. We, our kids have to look up to them and say, wow, I know them. But most importantly, we have to learn from our brothers and sisters who have been here from the black community in America. 20 to 30 percent of the slaves who were taken from Africa were Muslim. If you have been to or you would like to go to DC, I'm telling you to go there and visit the American Islamic Heritage Museum. A good friend of mine I learned from, I met from Hajj and we did Ta'aruf 
and we became very close friends and beloved brothers in faith. He has opened a building as big as this and he has collected from all over America all kinds of artifacts and writings of the American Muslim history. There is plain evidence you will see with your eyes that is scientific fact and real you're watching it that there were Muslims here before Christopher Columbus this is an amazing fact we should learn our history because this is how we will grow as a people we are a people deeply rooted in justice the most definitive verse of the Holy Quran about divine law in Allah Indeed, God commands to justice. Our scholars have all agreed that this is the fundamental point of Islamic law. So, the Quran tells us, those who are unjust are not guided and God does not like them. But injustice is perpetuated mostly by bystanders. People who are not performing the injustice, but they're not saying or doing anything about it. These are the biggest perpetrators because they have the power to stop it. There are not enough bullets, rubber or tear gas cans if all the people got together, woke up, jumped out of their hamster wheel and said, we will not stand for this type of oppression. When people's lives innocent people, when people who have done nothing wrong are being oppressed and abused, we will stand up for them. Our hearts are ripped apart as we watch the ethnic cleansing villages and people being burned alive in the Rohingya community of Myanmar. The mass exoduses and people washing up on the... people are just washing up on the shores dead. Large groups of them because they're being oppressed. And in UNC Charlotte a couple weeks ago, the ambassador came and everybody clapped for him, and then he spoke, and then everybody clapped. Three Muslim brothers, we were there and spoke up. And we were told that we've got the wrong information. Imagine if there were 300 Bell 3000. Do you think they would be able to get claps? Do you think at the end, with 3000 people, many of those ignorant fool folks over there going along with the World Affairs Council, would go along with that when they saw everybody but the reason why they're clapping is because that's what's going on the people will either join or be opposed and knowledge and ignorance and social interaction and real understanding of human realities it will solve all of the problems but we're plugged into a system that is keeping us busy, keeping us distracted. So brothers and sisters, we are now finding ourselves where it's important for us to see as Americans, how do we address this? I have to spoken with many Muslims who are serious believers. They believe in the Quran, they pray five times a day. They're in the political arena, they're attorneys, they've studied American law, they've been here for a long time. You know what they're all in agreement about? You cannot, and you are not fair, to ask anyone in this country to worry about what's happening in Palestine or Syria or Myanmar or Kashmir unless and until you own your reality as a respected, revered, contributing entity in this country. It's just the fact of reality. If you come seen as a separatist exclusivist group and nobody really knows you and you're like, hey guys, worry about all those people over there. They're like, what have you done for me lately? And our religion told us that when we go to a place, we establish ourselves with Rahmah. How can you be compassionate and merciful and caring to someone you don't even know them? How can you receive that from someone that you don't even know? You have no real relationship, or it's a very superficial relationship, or it's based on unfair suspicion, which the suspicion always comes from a lack of really understanding or knowing the other.
So this is the reality we see ourselves in. It is a fact that many Muslims are one of two extremes. Either they have lots of American friends but they hide their religion because they're not sure what they might think. Or they think they're very proud of their religion and so therefore they are completely separate from the rest of the society. These are extremes which are haram. The right one is very comfortable and proud of who they are and very appreciative and genuinely sincerely desiring to get to know those who are their neighbors and their colleagues and their co-workers and so forth. And they build real bonds, not superficial, not fake, not based on arguments and debates about theology in the uh, beginning get-go because of some need to control people. Because Allah is the one مُقَلِّبَ الْقُلُوبِ أَنْتَ لَسْتَ مُقَلِّبَ الْقُلُوبِ يَا عَبْدَ اللَّهِ This is where we have to see our reality. So it is so important that we get to know the black American experience. And we can build a connection very strongly with the black Muslim American experience because they know us very well and there's already a door open and we should have already had, there should have never been a door closed in the first place. And so it's very important for us to stand up for justice. We should know other people's reality, feel their pain, and stand up for them and defend their rights. So 400 years the black community has been oppressed, abused and humiliated in this country. 150 years now we find ourselves after they made a 13th amendment of the Constitution abolishing slavery. Yet there is still segregation, oppression, slavery systemically built into society. Segregated parts of society, the school system, if you are black and you get pulled over, you are treated very different than if you are white. When you are arrested, the white that did this crime and the black that did the very same crime get a different sentence. This is not my opinion, this is not liberals and conservatives, these are statistical facts you can find if you study it. And if you get to know black people, they will tell you they've lived it. If you don't know about it, you're coming up short as a Muslim who was commanded, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adl. He commands to justice. It's no secret why the Quran in Surah Al-Balad, the chapter about building an ideal city, Ideal state. ثُمَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبَرِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْمَرْحَمَةِ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ And then you will see from the believers that they interact with each other, helping people in patience, dealing with their calamities and hardships, lifting them up, being merciful, compassionate, understanding and feeling their pain and alleviating it by their words and deeds. Those are the people on the right path. Ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu ala al-ithmi wa al-udwan. You must interact with each other on righteousness and mindful good morals, not on sin and transgression. One way to interact or to support sin and transgression is to not say or do anything about it when you know it exists. There's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet that sums up our sermon today. Al Mu'minu Ya'laf wa yu'laf wa la khayru thima la ya'laf wa yu'laf wa khayruhum anfa'uhum lil nas. The Prophet said, The believer is sociable, genuine, concerned about others, coming to people with a smile, getting to know them, understanding how they are and what they enjoy. And they build these good social bonds with people they interact with. And then people like being around them and want to be in their presence as a result. And there is no good in someone who's a separatist, according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Based upon false weakness of faith, false ideas of preserving our identity, you are actually going against your identity. You just have weak faith in that you're scared you're going to lose it because you don't really have it yet. 
we have to embrace this religion as it came. The Prophet ﷺ concluded his statement, the best of all people are those who are beneficial. He said, خَيْرُهُمْ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ No, he didn't say that. That's an attitude of some Muslims and they're wrong. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, the best of them are those that are most beneficial to the people. All the people. People should be benefiting from us. We are successful in this country when people appreciate us for who we are because they know us and we know them, we can appreciate them, they can appreciate us and if we have differences, which is the normal human reality, we are respectful in our differences. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We've been talking about a proper approach, the MCC approach that we are trying to develop to the American Muslim identity as is found in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know that we have to reassess what we're doing, where our priorities are, how we are engaging, how we are integrating into society so that we can establish a proper future for our children's children. And guess what? The most amazing thing is, if we do this, when we've built these bonds and become known for who we are and what we represent as a faith community, no one will accept anyone saying, the Muslims are terrorists, they're out to destroy us, they're out to kill us all. Because they'll say, I know many Muslims very well. The problem is, most people can't say that, and that's our fault. We are our biggest enemy. We cannot sit here and pat ourselves on the back, we're on the hop, we have the truth, and those are all kufar doomed to hell. That is absolutely false rhetoric. And many khutaba need to re reassess who they are, and what they're doing, and where they live, and what's going on. So I'm telling you, right now, we have an opportunity tonight to come to watch a gripping, influential, moving documentary called 13th. It's a documentary about the 13th Amendment and how it has been a lie that has been perpetuated 150 years now that there's, we freed blacks, racism's over, everything's fine, get back to your business of making money in the capitalist system so these people can fly in their planes until their different homes that they all have. So I encourage you all to come out tonight. It is not a kid's movie. It will have some harsh realities and words in it. Documentary, real things you're watching. But the goal is that we will all reassess where we stand and who we are in relationship with our neighbors and establish a ground zero for how we can grow. Because the anti-Islam movement in many cases is also part of the racist movement towards anyone who's not white and Protestant. Ya Allah, beloved, merciful, compassionate provider, sustainer and maintainer, we ask you to illuminate our hearts with the light of your message. Ya Allah, make us a people of humble, sincere, genuine desire to live the example of your Prophet, to show compassion and mercy and benevolence to the world around us. Ya Allah, make us be the beneficial people of those around us. Make us be known and respected and revered for our contributions. Ya Allah, help us to realize the need to join with each other as Muslims, to join with the non-Muslims who can relate with us on our values and establish a platform that can bring justice and goodness and erase corruption and tyranny. Ya Allah, we ask you to help us to see the beauty of your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to embody and follow his example in our lives and that we may be resurrected and drink from the fountain and the kawthar in his presence and have the eternal bliss of being in your presence. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, for our laziness, for our weakness, for our neglect. Ya Allah, please give us a comprehensive approach 
to understanding the justice, the wisdom, the mercy and the compassion of this message that you have revealed to us. Ya Allah, please raise amongst our children people who are serious about their soul and the souls of those around them looking to build a good society, eradicating corruption and injustice. Ya Allah, please help us to realize that this life will go and it will go fast. So let's make sure that we leave the lasting mark of the light of your message that you have intended. Ya Allah, beautify in us our character by the example of the Prophet ﷺ and make us those who are dedicated to learning your message and understanding it, living by it and properly presenting it and conveying it to those around us. Ya Allah, send your peace, blessings and mercy upon your final messenger Muhammad wa aqin salih Yeah, look at the